only build what your users need, but also make sure to involve the right stakeholders from the beginning. If I'm, for example, now implementing a content management system, it would be very stupid not to consult the content managers, the copywriters, because ultimately they will need to use that product. I think it's it's really key to to be building for for users, for end users, and to take the right stakeholders on board. And since there is so much possibilities and so many roads to go, I would also say to really only fix the problems that you have and not fix problems you don't have. Welcome to the e-commerce toolbox, Expert Perspectives, a podcast by Noivu, where we explore the elite strategies and cutting edge insights with our expert guests. Get ready to propel your e-commerce business to the next level. Welcome to another episode of the e-commerce toolbox experts perspective. Joining us today, uh, we have Jesse Hanse. Um, so he heads up e-commerce at Paula's Choice. So welcome, uh, Jesse, to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So uh, head of the show is taking a look. You have quite a diverse background. You worked in wine. You worked in a couple of different spaces before landing at Paula's Choice. So maybe talk to us a bit about your career journey and how you ended up in your role. Yeah. Um, actually, I didn't even start with wine. I, I'm a trained dancer, so I worked as a professional dancer for quite some time with different theaters and various productions and musicals, operas, whatever. Um, and while I was working there, I actually did uh, start a startup for myself um, uh, where I wanted to sell art from young artists. I saw a lot of talent around me, but... Um, young artists really had difficulties landing uh, a spot at a gallery, which you need to sell your art. And I saw that e was coming up. So it was like, why not selling art online? And that was basically my first connection to e-commerce. I failed with that startup, but sometimes you need failure to understand what you need to learn. And that's basically when I uh, went to Berlin, started working, uh, at a company, Wine in Black, who is a e-com first or deep sea first wine store. And yeah, from there, I really mostly got interested in uh, product management and the actual development of a tech product, not developing myself, but uh, really connecting business to the IT side. And that's also what brought me to Polish Choice, ultimately. The, the role really attracted me there because it was very much a 50-50 combination of being product owner of the tech product, the, the shops, and at the same time, uh, leading the business. So having having your internal team, p and responsibility, and really yeah, running the business. So that that for me was a, a reason to uh, go to Paula's Choice. That's, that's cool. And, and was there a specific opening when you're kind of going over where you saw maybe they were looking at changing up some architecture or looking at making some more kind of technology investments? Curious to learn a bit more about that. Um, when I joined Polis Choice, they were very much uh, growing. Um, what interested me mostly is that they were one of the first D2C brands. And I would say they are still one of the, the biggest D2C first skincare brands. Um, and the reason for it, I find always very interesting is that um, at Polish Choice, content and education is really at, at the heart of the brand. So the brand really wants to control that narrative. And in order to do so, um, having your own platform, having your own sales chan- channels really helps you to embed education within your product offering. That's uh, that's really interesting. Maybe talk to us a bit about how, um, since you've joined, you guys have gone down the path of re-architecting the website, doing some migrations, maybe even in introducing some elements of composability. Maybe talk us through your thought process. Uh, I think we have a good understanding of kind of your background, but maybe talk to us a bit more about your thought process of, of yeah. how you're able to kind of bring some of your expertise in. Yeah. So... Um... With growth, you will always have pains, growth pains, and sometimes pains that really force you to make drastic decisions in your architecture, in the way your business is set up. Um, For example, expanding to different countries requires a whole different approach. Um, When you go from one country to two countries, you might get away with it just adding one more merchandiser or uh, one more developer. 
But if you if you go into 10 new countries, you really need to redefine the way processes work and um, the way the architect architecture basically serves the business needs. And what I always really like to say is start where it hurts. So only solve those issues that you really have. Um, for example, when we expanded to multiple countries, um, multiple languages, um, we were working with uh, Salesforce Commerce Cloud and are still working with Salesforce Commerce Cloud, but all our content was also within the e-com platform in HTML, typically, um, in multiple different modules within the backend of uh, Salesforce, which made, which required actually someone to have coding knowledge to be able to adjust content or to localize content. And that would mean if we would translate a shop and, and open a new country, um, I would need someone to be working full-time for three months on just exporting, importing the content. That would not even be uh, the translation of it, but really just getting the content ready for translation and bringing back that translated content. Um, obviously not scalable. Um, so then we decided to um, implement a translation management system that could do all of that for us and basically automate the whole um, translation management while still having um, native copywriters and native translators working in that system. Um, and I think that it's always key to look at what your real problems are um, before you start even moving down the way of composability or making architectural changes. It really, um, yeah, I don't know. For me, it's really to start where the, where the, where it hurts, where the pain is. Makes sense. And I, I definitely hear the founder in you because that's kind of one of the, the earliest things that you learn in, in trying to start a business is like go and find the hairiest, scariest, biggest problem and then try and build to fix it. And it sounds mm -hmm. like that's what you've done within the businesses that you're part of. So that's, that's really cool to hear. Maybe talk to us a bit about how do you like, do you have a methodology for figuring out what the biggest problem is? Like, do you chase the KPIs? Yeah. Do you listen to your customers? And then how do you stack rank and, and actually start to, to, to kind of pick which problem you try and solve and, and when? Yeah. Um, so of course, KPIs, user, uh, tests, really just listen to your user, always realize that you're not solving a problem for the business. Ultimately you are solving a problem for your end users. They should always be at the center of what you do. Um, what really helps me to identify, uh, pain points, um, because you also don't want to wait until, I don't know, you have two broken arms and two broken legs, then it hurts, but you can also not do anything about it anymore. Um, I uh, like to go through the exercise for myself every now and then to amplify signs or uh, potential issues. And um, as, a, as a metaphor, there is this artist, Olafur Eliasson, uh, uh, artist from Iceland, and he was looking at the glaciers melting down but if you stand in front of a glacier and see it melt down, you don't see it melt down. You don't see the change. So what he did, he took pictures uh, from those glaciers and took this from pictures from the exact same spots 20 years later. And basically by visually amplifying the melting glaciers, you could see the actual, uh, actual change. And every now and then I try to basically be very pessimistic. When I see an issue occur, occur, then I really want to go down that pessimistic road and think like, okay, but if this is the issue now, in five years time, our software uh, architecture is outdated or this or that platform isn't relevant anymore. So I think it's a combination of um, looking back, which KPIs are always looking back and uh, amplifying the issues that you already have at hand. Yeah. That's uh that's really interesting and and you mentioned composability earlier. How do you look at architecture composability to be able to solve problems that are maybe regionally more present for businesses that do a lot of European business, right? Um, yeah. Where there's a lot of different countries, a lot of different geos, a lot of different shipping methods, yeah, all in kind of a pretty dense area. 
uh, yeah. yeah, maybe talk to us a bit about how you how you look at that. Um, I think it's where we uh, Polish Choice is a, is a global business. I'm responsible for the EMEA region, uh, which, as you say, has a lot of different currencies, uh, different languages, and also just different users within those countries, different needs. Um, so you always try to find the balance between streamlining, globalizing, making sure there's one tech stack for everybody to use, but still weave in as much flexibility for the regions to run the business uh, that they see fit for their market. Um, and composability does help with this. For example, um, recently we have opened a new store in South Africa, uh, which is our first entrance into the African market. Um, but our payment service provider that we use for the rest of Europe is not uh, active in Africa. So we did need a new payment service provider. And uh, with composability, it's relatively easy to say, okay, well, we'll take out the, the plug from the one payment service provider and we plug in a new payment service provider. Um, so it, it allows for flexibility on a regional level rather than having a very fixed um, tech stack that, that needs to fit all the markets. I like that. What are some of the tactical benefits that you've seen by adopting this strategy and architecture? Is there an example that kind of comes to mind? Um, I think the example for a payment service provider is, is a good example. Um, but also, for example, well, within Polish Choice, I would say content is at the heart of the brand. Paula Begun, the founder of Polish Choice, really uh, actually started out as a writer, as a journalist. She wrote books. She was on uh, the opera show known as the uh, Cosmetic Cop um, before she started selling products. So content is really very important to the brand and also is the... Uh, uh, the reason to exist or it's 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 so in, yeah it's such a part of the brand that you cannot do without and then i would say the structure we had where content lived in a platform that was basically designed for uh merchandising and for for selling products just didn't allow for flexibility and freedom that our content editors that our uh skincare experts need so yeah that was her thing so we took out content and brought it to a uh, content management system that is designed just to manage content. Um, and I think there, there is the power of uh, composability. Also, it's, it's been such a, a buzzword, composable, whereas I think almost every business, uh, big or small, is composable in a way. Because, you know, you either have a separate ERP or uh, a payment service provider and that already means you are connecting multiple applications to together run one process, make sure an order gets shipped or whatever. Um, and it's always a search to see how granular do you want to go. And I would also say it's not bad to have a monolith. Monoliths can be very good at performing a, a task. But if you feel that it's limiting you, that it that it takes away flexibility, then it might be time to split off certain functions, certain modules, um, and and have specialized third parties that that do just that function. And even one step further, there is sometimes business needs that you can only build as your business because it's such a part. As an example, with Polish Choice, we have our uh, ingredient dictionary which is a, a dictionary where we list 26,000 skincare ingredients, which are rated, described by professionals. And on top of that dictionary, we build um, uh, an ingredient checker, which what the vision was, we wanted people to take us to the cosmetic counter, take whatever skincare product, take a picture of the ingredient list, and it would scan it out and basically tell you is it a good or a bad product? Or at least are the ingredients within that product good, bad? What do they do for your skin? That is such specific need and knowledge. You you won't find any any third party that, that offers that as a product. 
So we, we decided to build that ourselves as a microservice. And I think any healthy e-commerce ecosystem or, or architecture consists of monoliths, microservices, and sometimes cater to third parties that are just doing one function very good. Yeah. No, I, I think it makes sense. And, and, and I think you said it earlier on and aligning all of this back to KPIs to drive the business forward, increase market share, open up more markets. Maybe talk to us a bit about some of your tactical initiatives for this year. Like uh, assuming you have all your uh, architecture set up, how are you looking as a PL owner um, at this year? And, and what are some of the bets that are that are being placed? Um, I think the bets that are placed are still very much around content. We're in the in the middle of our migration, uh, where we are still pulling out content. Also want to uh, add more channels to the content management system. Um, but I would say what I find really interesting and and a, a way the brand looks looks at the business is education first, product second. Um, because there's so much misinformation on about skincare on the internet. On it's it's really quite a, a complex product to to sell. In the end, you cannot really try it. You don't know how your skin reacts on it, and you do need basic knowledge about uh, your skin and your skin concerns to be able to find the right product. And um, I really would, yeah, I really like to take that to the extreme, where it's really first educating users. And that product will come because we know we we trust in our products. We know that they can solve certain issues or that they can help you with your skin concerns. Um, so I think that on a on a longer term is really the, the vision that is leading, um, and that also frees up a lot of space to do almost non commercial products like an ingredient dictionary or an ingredient checker. It's not like that is, you cannot take that from the KPIs. The KPIs won't tell you like, hey, you, you might need uh, to build an extensive dictionary or library where, uh, which you need to maintain, which is costly. No, that really has to come from a vision. And I would say in, in optimizing, there is um, a role for yeah, conversion rate optimization. We have a, a nice CRO pri- program, which is uh, really looking at the KPIs and seeing through A-B tests, how, how can, can we uh, make the product better? But there is also um, uh, a big need for visionary um, product ideas or feature ideas. No, that's that's great, Je- Jesse. And as we look to wrap up, any parting words of wisdom? Something that you wish you knew when you first got uh, got started in this industry? Only build what your users need, but also make sure to involve the right stakeholders from the beginning. If I'm, for example, now implementing a content management system, it would be very stupid not to consult the content managers, the copywriters, because ultimately they will need to use that product. I think it's it's really key to to be building for for users for end users and to take the right stakeholders on board and since there is so much possibilities and so many roads to go i would also say to really only fix the problems that you have and not fix problems you don't have love it listen to your customers be yeah. have conviction on the challenges and actually don't start building things that you think are cool but might not drive value to the users. Well, yeah. thanks, Jesse. This was a this was a pleasure, and uh, thank you again. Thank you. The e-commerce toolbox expert perspectives is brought to you by Noibu. To find out more about Noibu and how we can help you debug your e-commerce site and rocket your revenue, visit www.noibu.com. That's n-o-i-b-u.com. And then make sure to search for the e-commerce toolbox expert perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Noibu, thanks for listening.